it's a, it's a celebration of a feast day. We actually don't see the Bible requiring that to do that, but um, we're talking about uh, the Feast of Purim, which was about Esther. And I want to talk to you today about um, how God delivers us, how he turns things around and redeems what's lost, how he overrules anything the enemy will try to do, and how he prospers us and provides for us even in the times of lack. And he leads us and guides us. He's our shepherd. Now, I'm going to come back here in just a couple of minutes. And uh, Dr. Patricia is going to come now. We're going to do something different. Uh, for a few weeks, she's going to be teaching briefly on one of the names of God, which we want to apply it for this week. few weeks, as Archbishop said, we're we going to explore a different name each week Amen. and what it means and how we can apply it to our lives. <coughs> some of you may have heard of some of the names, so we're going to start off with some of the more familiar names, and then we'll go into a few of the names that aren't quite as familiar, but they're very powerful. This week, we're going to learn about the meaning of Jehovah. Ra, Ra or Rohai, or some people say Yahweh, Ra or Rohai. Ra is R A A H, Rohai, R O H I. We find God as Jehovah, Ra or Rohai in Psalm 23. We had that, we were singing uh, about Psalm 23 in the uh, worship service, which was so appropriate. The word Ra is derived from the word Roeh, meaning shepherd in Hebrew. Translated, it carries the idea of the shepherd's tender, loving care for his sheep. <clears throat> the condition of the sheep is a direct correlation to the way the shepherd takes care of the sheep. In Psalm 23, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Then he went on to give a very personalized account of Yahweh Rohi. Mm -hmm. I prefer Yahweh. You can say Jehovah. Either one is correct. When I think of Yahweh Roha, I think of him as my personal shepherd. Yeah. Yeah. I personalize the name that it belongs to me. Yeah. He is my shepherd and he leads me daily. As we learn about the names, perhaps you can personalize them for yourself as well. Yeah. Because this makes it more, it's yours. You own it. Yes. And it takes on more meaning for you. The primary meaning of Roha is to feed. This word was first used in Genesis 37-2 when Joseph fed the flock with his brothers, also in Genesis 47-3-4. Joseph and King David were both, start, they both started out as shepherds. That's how they began. And then see what happened with them. <laughs> Another meaning of Roha is the relationship between a prince or leader and his people. We find this in 2 Samuel 5, 2. This type of bond is an integral part of Yahweh and his people. Its importance lies in the mutual acceptance of obligations between both parties. In this context, Roha can be interpreted as an expression of loyalty between both parties based on mutual trust, respect, and responsibility. This relationship is not only hierarchical in nature, but also reciprocal, reciprocal in terms of responsibility and accountability. What I mean by this is he tells us what we should do in his word. It's our responsibility to do it. If we do what he says, then he, do, he does what he... <laughs> Sorry. He does what... He says he will do. Yeah. There's an if in there. If we do. Yes. He is not obligated to do anything for us if we don't follow what his word says for us to do. The word Roha can also signify the relationship between a priest or a prophet and his people. 
in Jeremiah 3.15, he says, the Lord says, I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So he's going to give us pastors. Pastors feeding us with the knowledge and the word means more than just theoretical or abstract concepts. Instead, this promise speaks directly to the practical realities of everyday life. As believers, we are called upon not only to understand God's truth, but also to put it into action in our daily interaction with others. Amen. At its heart, then, this promise reminds us that being a believer requires an ongoing commitment to learn and grow and to seek out and receive practical teachings that you can apply to your own life. Many people don't realize that the word rohai can also be used in relation to folly and judgment. Hmm. Yahweh Roha wants to lead his followers away from foolishness mm -hmm. and towards wisdom. Yes. This means that when we seek guidance from God, we can trust that he will steer us in the right direction yes. if we listen. <laughs> when we make decisions without consulting him, we fall into folly and make poor choices. Have you ever done that? Yes. I know I have. Mm -hmm. I try not to do that. But occasionally it does happen, and then I have to repent and go from there. In addition to providing guidance, Yahweh Roha also serves as judge over our lives. Hmm. He's a judge over our lives. He sees everything as we th that we do, and he knows our heart. We cannot hide anything from him. As such, he holds us accountable for our actions and will ultimately judge us accordingly. When that day comes for me, I hope that I can stand up in, to his judge, judgment and fear <clears throat> that I have been a good and faithful servant. Amen. Ezekiel 34, 16 tells us that God will feed false shepherds with judgment. That's interesting. He's very upset with shepherds who care more for themselves than for the people. Though through misuse and abuse, wolves in sheep's clothing rip and tear the sheep apart. God and man deplore and reject such a ministry. These ministries, you can tell these ministries. It's not good. When you see Yahweh as your shepherd, there's so much more to it than just a comforting image of being loved and cared for and led. This figurative comparison is a powerful one that carries with it deep theological implications. It speaks to the loving relationship between God and his people. Yes. And everything they need to thrive, he provides. Yes. At its core, the concept of God is shared <clears throat> implies love. The kind of love that ensures his flock are well fed and taken care of, just as a good shepherd will lead their sheep to green pastures. Yahweh leads his children to places where they can flourish spiritually. Beyond simply providing sustenance, he also brings judgment when necessary, much like how a shepherd would keep watch for predators looking to harm their flock. Another as important aspect of seeing Yahweh as your shepherd is recognizing that he will keep you from folly. In the Bible, there are numer numerous stories of people who made foolish decisions and suffered the consequences. <clears throat> However, there are also stories where God intervened and prevented his people from making mistakes that would have led them into disaster. Yeah. It's important to understand that God desires for us to live a life that is free from foolishness and mistakes. He's given us a word as a guidebook. It's a guidebook for, for our lives, <laughs> and when we, when we follow it, we can avoid many pitfalls along the way. Yes. Additionally, when we ask for his guidance and wisdom and prayer, he promises to give it freely. Have you asked for his guidance lately? I know I have many times. <laughs> While God will not shield us completely from every mistake or bad decision we could make in life, it's comforting to know that he does promise to be with us through every trial and challenge we face. He's right there. <coughs> 
there's much more the name of, of the name Yahweh or Jehovah Ra Rohi, but because of time constraints, I won't go into the others, but you can do some research for yourselves on that if you wish. The next week we'll explore another name <coughs> attributed to Yahweh. Amen. I'd, I'd like to ask you to please remember to pray for the United States and our government and anything that you see that's happening in the news or as you're traveling around the, the, uh, the city from place to place. And please don't forget to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for Israel. There's a blessing for you in that. Amen. May you have a blessed week filled with his shalom. Thank you. Archbishop. so many different names of God that is it's amazing what some of the names um, characterize for our lives and what we do I want to talk to you today about something I believe that will help us um, how God delivers us and honors us probably every day or every few days I usually quote Psalms 91 from one all the way to the end and I love the last couple of verses it says, and the Lord will deliver you and honor you. So he will never deliver you without honoring you. He'll never honor you without delivering you. Now, sometimes, I was thinking about this early this morning, the wee hours of the morning, that we're still trying to adjust to the time change. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if I'm elected governor, we will not change time again in Florida. Excuse me while we fix the mic here. It's on, it's on green. Are we there? Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> sometimes I think about this. Sometimes we barely notice ourselves walking through an open door that we've been praying for for so long. And it's open, but we've prayed for it for so long, we don't even realize it and walk through it. That happens to me often. I love what the Lord said to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. He said, uh, the Lord appeared to me, <clears throat> and he said, <clears throat> saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love from afar. Meaning, even though you were far off, he saw you. And he said, I have continued my faithfulness for you. So as we get into this, I want to talk to you about being the Esther generation. The Lord will reverse everything that the enemy assigns to do to us. He's capable of it, but he's also made us capable. Now, we know his plans are perfect. Everything he does is perfect. His purposes, his will, everything's perfect. Whereas in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, he said, And the Lord has made everything beautiful in his time. And I was reading again a few days ago, read it probably hundreds of times, but in Mark chapter 7, Jesus had just been teaching, and then he was healing the sick, and the people, one translation said the Pharisees says, wow, he did all things well. <laughs> so everything he does is well. Everything he plans, everything, everything that he puts together, it's perfect. Now think about this for a moment as I lay some foundation. We've heard the phrase, the right place at the right time. Too many times we miss what God has planned because we're not where he planned us to be when he planned us to be there. That sounds confusing, but it's absolutely true. How many times have we missed it? There's an old cliche I heard years ago, but it said you can't catch a fish if you're not near the water. So it's being, again, the perfect place at the perfect time. I heard about a postal worker some time ago, a number of years ago, but uh, she had a route in New York City, and every day she prayed the Lord would give her or lead her to someone she could help, someone that would be of assistance. And she went out on her route, but as she started early that morning, Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, go four streets over. But she said, but that's not on my route. Holy Spirit said, go four streets over. So she did. And when she got there, Holy Spirit said, now go down three blocks. True story. And so she went down three blocks. This is totally off of her route. And the Holy Spirit said, <clears throat> go down these three blocks. She did. And then he said, stop. She's in front of a tall apartment building. Holy Spirit said, look up. So she's staring up. 
and there's nothing there. <laughs> you know, if the apartment building is there, you know, you can do that in a busy city and start looking up and everybody else will look up too. Well, people around her started looking up and to her horror, she only be standing there less than a minute. A baby fell out of the sixth floor window and landed right in her arms. Now, I've talked about that one time before, but talk about being in the right place at the right time, exactly what God had planned. God knew what he was going to do. Now, we've used this verse many times, uh, all of us, I think, that are believers. We've read it, but Psalms 1, Blessed is a man that walks under the counsel of the godly, stand in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, brings forth his fruit in his season. There's a season when the fruit will be produced. His leaves will not wither. Here's the key. And everything he does shall prosper. That's talking about man, woman, boy, and girl. At the right place where he's placed us, that's where the prosperity and victory comes. Now, as the church, and I see this so often, it, it seems like we've gone through a myriad of changes over the generations. I was reading some church history this last week uh, from our Bible college, and we have a course on Bible history and world history. And I was looking at some of the things that the church has gone through, but tragically, not all of God's people have accepted the changes that he brings. We kind of, we go back to the time of the judges in the book of Judges in the Bible, where every person or man or woman did what was right in their own eyes. We would judge ourselves. Well, that's not what's going to happen to us. But numerous times, if we'll look back at it, the Lord has brought a divine interruption to bring about his divine purpose in our lives, redirecting us. Sometimes we don't want to be redirected. <laughs> I remember one time years ago in Philadelphia, <clears throat> rain was pouring down, construction going on. I didn't have a GPS. So I was trying to find, find my way to a hotel that was reserved for me, and I found myself on a one-way street. And I'm going the wrong way, and cars are going this way, and it's raining. And a police officer stepped out and stopped me. And he said, where are you going? I said, I'm from Florida. He said, I don't care if you're from Mars. You're going the wrong way. Get off of this road. So he was trying to redirect me. He was a little kinder than that, but I didn't know where I was going because I, I couldn't see the signs because it was raining so hard. Now, God will redirect us from time to time, from the direction we're going to spare us. Now, too often, and this is for the comfortable believer, too often multitudes of lukewarm, um, remaining comfortable believers, non-demanding, stale relationship, low power, non-committed believers do not want to change things. They refuse to change because it may cost them time. It may cost them perhaps inconvenience, but most of all conviction. Now we saw a lot of this when COVID hit the world. We saw this in churches across the country that people got comfortable. Now, I believe we're seeing that change now coming back in, into the way it ought to be. Uh, recently I was teaching on something <clears throat> in another place <clears throat> and um Back in the 1970s, something took place that was a false doctrine. Actually, it started in the 50s, and then it subsided in the late 60s, came back again in the 70s. It was a false doctrine that was talking about inclusion. Now, it had nothing to do with race. It was gender. That was all the way back in 1970. Now, there's a minister that I know. He's still going today, but not very strong. But this false doctrine said you can do anything you want to do because the whole world are God's children and the whole world was born into this world saved. So there's nothing you can do. I can't believe that someone that taught the Bible for so many years, like a man I'm thinking about right now, that would promote this doctrine. He had thousands of followers. Anyway, he continued to promote it, and it kind of died down a little bit, but in 2000, 
it rose back up again in the new millennial. And the same teaching again, inclusion, had nothing to do with race. It was all about gender, and it was all about noncommittal. God's not going to judge you. This one person, not allowed to mention the name, said, all the years I've taught the Bible, I'm beginning to see the Bible's not true. Well, Paul said, what if some do not believe? Does that make the word of God of none effect? He said, no. But <clears throat> this doctrine continues. Now, the word I'm talking about, inclusion, I'm, I'm going to get to Esther here in a moment. But we hear inclusion today everywhere we turn. Politically, even religiously, the church and the government, again, not having things to do with race, but again, it's gender, and it's including, including everybody. The World Council of Churches right now, which is a foundation for Antichrist, right now, Islam, um, uh, Hindu, and uh, Buddhism, you name it, right down the line, are all connected together with those that call themselves Christians in a certain denomination. Now, that's not the will of God. That, that can't work that way. But in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, I don't have time for all the verses there, but, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, John was hearing the Lord uh, rebuke, actually correcting the seven churches of Asia. And he started out with the church of Ephesus. And he started out with a praise. God, God always does this. Sometimes he'll bring correction and then give you praise. Other times he starts out with praise and gives you correction. But to the church of Ephesus, man, they, they did just felt wonderful because he said, I've recognized your work. I've seen your gifts, everything. But he said, I have one thing against you. You've left your first love. You've lost the passion that you had for me. If you regain that passion, here's what's going to happen. Then he went down to the church of Philadelphia, the church of Thyatira. And then he came down to number seven, to the church of Laodicea. Some people pronounce it differently. But he said, here's what I have against you, paraphrase. You're not Luke, or you're not cold or hot. You're not either one. You're lukewarm. And he said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Now, that's a judgment. I read one translation a few years ago, and I found it again this last week. Oh, I would hate to hear this. He actually said, you disgust me. How would you like God to say that to you? That church, Laodicea, they were, they were non-committed, non-commissioned, so to speak, and everything they were doing it was against what God had said. And finally, in that, that translation, he said, you disgust me. Now, let me give you an ancient example of being comfortable and staying where you are. <clears throat> King Cyrus of Persia, which is modern-day Iran, when he overthrew the Babylonian kingdom, which is Iraq, he made a decree that all the Jews that were there in captivity could return to Palestine. <clears throat> 2.5. 5 million or so people, according to history. Only 40, about 49,000, according to history, says that they left and went back to Palestine. The remainder of the people stayed there because it was comfortable. They developed a lifestyle. They don't want to have to make this long travel to get there, so they stayed there. And because of that comfortable thing that they had, the blessings of God was gone. Now, it's something I've noticed for myself. Maybe some of you have experienced it. Uh, for a long time, the Lord has made me comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think I heard you say that one time. <laughs> being comfortable with being uncomfortable. What in the world does that mean? That means that you don't just settle down because you don't know when he's going to move you and do something in your life that's going to bring the change around you. So you become comfortable. I've said it over and over to me, wherever I heard that, but I have become comfortable being uncomfortable because I know I'm ready to do, or I'm trying to be ready to do everything he says and the changes that he brings. Now, he will, for our sakes, reverse every assignment that the enemy, the devil, has brought against us. And remember this, the giant in you is larger than any giant in the world, giants in the world. He's enabled us, he's empowered us, and equipped us to defeat the enemy. And he will use his power to rescue us in every situation. Keep this in mind. He will rescue us from the mockers over and over and over. I heard about this college professor, <clears throat> total atheist. 
and he's standing on his podium or platform teaching his class, and it was about world religion and history. And he said, I'm going to prove to you that God is not real. He doesn't exist. So he laid down his book, and he stood behind his little podium standing on the stage, and there's many, many students. And he said, okay, God, if you're real, I give you five minutes to knock me off the stage. Timed it, five minutes, nothing happened. He said, see, I told you, students. He said, I'm going to give him one more chance. God, I'm going to give you one more. If you're really real, I give you three minutes to knock me off the stage. Now, he didn't realize that he had some spirit-filled students in the classroom that are praying under their breath in the spirit. And walking down the hallway, out on the outside of the classroom, there's a 300-pound gorilla football player. <laughs> and he stopped. Born again, spirit filled. And he heard the professor say this. And all of a sudden, he's running full speed down the aisle. He leaps up on the stage and bam, hits the professor, knocks him over, knocks him out, and falls on the ground. And then he helps him up. And the professor said, why did you do that? He said, God sent me. He was busy, but he sent me. <laughs> but the point is, the mocker <laughs> will be overcome. Now, <clears throat> Once again, in Mark 7, 37, they said Jesus did all things well. Now, there's 30, what is it, 39 books in the Old Testament, 66 altogether in the Bible. In those 39 books of the Bible, they're historic, they're prophetic, they're poetic, and they're revelatory. And every book that you read in the Old Testament, it's like a schoolmaster. It's a preparation for what was going to take place in the New Covenant. And as we read these, over and over and over and over, realizing that it's faith testimonies, historic testimonies. But they're still, God's still doing those testimonies today. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Now, this past Tuesday, March the 7th, was a celebration we call Purim, pronounced in a different way, a celebration of the books of Esther and her act of faith. Some of you might have heard this story, but let me give you a quick on the story. <clears throat> She was part of the people that didn't leave Persia, when, even though Cyrus allowed this. And she grew up uh, educated with all of those that were there. Her parents died, and she, her uncle Mordecai raised her, but she had no idea what the purpose was for her life. But God had chosen her out of over two million people. Can you imagine that? Like he chose Mary out of millions and millions. But she had no idea what was about, about to take place in her life. Now, King Ahasuerus, who was now the king, <clears throat> Ahasuerus, um, had a party, a drunken party that actually turned into a terrible orgy. He invited all of his royals, all of his friends, wealthy people, to come to this party that lasted for days and days and days. And uh, history says that they put on different costumes of, of different types. And Queen Vashta was the queen that time. She was beautiful, and the king wanted to present her to all of his friends. So he sent word for her to come, and she refused. Paraphrase, I'm not going to be part of this drunken party. And he was disappointed, but then his leaders around him said, look, if you don't correct her and do something about this, this is going to spread through the kingdom with all the other women. <laughs> Women's rights was going to spring up. Anyway, he did so, and he removed her from being queen. Now, in the meantime, Esther is being trained. Esther is schooled, but she has no idea what's about to take place. And she grew up to be a beautiful young woman. Now, the king advertised or actually commanded to bring a harem of the slave girls before him. And he saw all these beautiful women walking in front of him, and he's choosing, but then he saw Esther. Her name was Hadassah, but they changed her name to Esther. And as, they, as she walked across the stage and the king saw her, he said, that's the one. And he appointed her, anointed her, ordained her to be queen in the kingdom. Now, there's a lot that goes on in the story here. But the leaders, once again, are seeing her, but they're thinking in their minds a historical view. She's a Jew. She has nothing to do with this kingdom. But the king said, this is what I want. The king always gets what he wants. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Esther is being brought now into this position, but her DNA screams, I'm Hadassah. But the people of the kingdom are calling her Esther. Now, as the king continues to get to know her, but before he brings her in, she's got to go through a time of refining, a time of purification, and for many different reasons. Now, she never wore fine apparel before that. She never sat at the king's table. She never wore fine jewelry. None of that. She was a slave girl. Now, she had to go through the purification. Some of the meanings of purification scripture means to be free from impurities, to cultivate behavior, to be made free from what was unbecoming, or to cultivate and train to reign as royalty. Now, if you'll remember, uh, when was it, 2001? 2000, no, 2010 or 11, I'm sorry. Uh, Kate Middleton and Prince William, remember, uh, he, they were engaged, but it was not made public. The queen didn't allow it to become public. They'd been dating for a while, but she didn't let it become public until uh, Kate went through purification. It wasn't that she was not impure, but she had to be trained. She had to be schooled. She had to be educated to learn how to reign in the position she was about to come into. And she went through all of the process. Then the queen finally announced it. They were married. I think it was 2011 they were married. But the point is this. The same thing was going on with Esther. She was being schooled. She was being trained to reign as a queen. Now, we've said this many times, but some people don't remember it. God is constantly training us, forming us, shaping us, and molding us to reign, not in heaven, but reign on earth. We don't need to reign in heaven when that time comes, but to rule and reign as kings and priests on this earth. Revelation chapter 1, John said, He has made us kings and priests unto our God, and we shall reign. Now, with Mordecai, who was, one translation says it was Esther's cousin, another one presents him as uh, her uncle. Mordecai was a strong Jewish elder a man who just would not bow to anything that was not of God. And King Ahasuerus appointed the captain of his army, Haman. He appointed him like a position of prime minister. Now, Haman thinks he's arrived. He's gotten to a position he would have never dreamed he would get to. And every day when he would go down the street, people would bow to him, except for Mordecai, the Jew. <laughs> he stood strong and straight. He would bow to nobody but the Lord God. Now, Haman got tired of this. So he got a plan and a plot. Now, there's a meaning to this whole story. He, he, he devised a plan, and he went to the king and said, Listen, these Jews that are living here that wouldn't leave, listen, they're, they're teaching another religion. There's disrespect in them going on in their community for you and for this kingdom. And he said, I vote that we annihilate, we genocide them. Now, if God had allowed that, there wouldn't be any life. Anyway, the king gave him permission. He had no idea that Esther, he really didn't realize this or think about it, that Esther is a Jew. Now, Haman was going to carry out this act of destruction and killing these people. Now, Esther is now queen. Mordecai gets word of what's about to take place. But while this is going on, Scripture said he sat at the city gates. Now, he was, he, as a Jew, he was not allowed to do that, but he did it with the elders. And he would hear what's being talked about in the community and what's going on. See, if we open our ears spiritually, God will let us hear what's taking place in the spirit and politically before it ever comes out. If some of you might remember that some of the things the Lord said to us, it was coming this year. One of the things about the weather and other things, you just continue one thing after another. He warns us in advance how to pray. So now Mordecai is sitting at the gate, and he hears two of the elders of the leaders talking. And they're making a plan, a plot to overthrow the kingdom. And he hears this, but doesn't tell anybody about it. But somehow he gets word to the king of Hasrus. And he, it's written in the Chronicles of the, the books of, of the history of what's going on. 
And Mordecai has already dispatched him, but, but the king just kind of doesn't pay any attention to it. The story's brief here. Anyway, <clears throat> the king can't sleep, and he's awake off and all night. Listen, God will trouble those that will try to harm you and turn them in a different way. And that's exactly what it did to the king. The king had already given permission to Haman start killing the Jews and without realizing it. But anyway, he, he told one of his servants he couldn't sleep, woke up in the middle of the night, and he said, bring me the chronicles of history. What has happened here in the kingdom lately? So he begins. the, the man begins to read it. And as he continues to read, he comes across this, this part where there was a plot to kill the king and overthrow the, the throne. Are you getting this? I mean, this is a long story here. But he hears this, and he says to the servant, what did we do for such a man that did this? He said, nothing. He said, well, we've got to reward him. Now, Esther gets word about this. Mordecai gets word because he was the one that gave the report. And Esther devises a banquet. She plans a banquet, and she told the king, I want to have a banquet. I want you and I want you to invite Haman to come to this banquet, just you and him. Well, Haman gets this word. Now, in the meantime, they're building a gallows because he's going to destroy Mordecai. But Haman thinks now he's going to get another promotion. He's rising to the top. See, God will sometime let a person that's going to bring destruction to others believe what they want to believe just to get them in the right place. So Haman's excited, tells his wife, you're not going to believe it. They've invited me to a banquet and nobody's coming but me and the king. He has the banquet, everything's wonderful. And now again, he's still, he's still talking to the king about destroying all these Jews. Well, Mordecai hears again this report. And he says to Esther, this is the famous verse that most everyone knows, Esther 4.14. He said, how do you know that God has not brought you into the kingdom for such a time as this? What he was saying is, Esther, your background doesn't even give an indication of this. The way you grow up, grew up doesn't even give an indication that this is going to happen to you. But this is your appointed time. I'm paraphrasing. This is your appointed time. This is your appointed day. You've been brought into the kingdom for this very time for this very purpose. Now, sometimes I'm, maybe some of you that are here are listening, you wonder why you're still living. <laughs> I've talked about this too many times, I guess, but two airplane crashes and all other sorts of stuff over the years. And I was telling Dr. Patricia the other day, I honestly, and I believe I can say this with a pure heart, I'm not afraid of death at all. I'm afraid of life <laughs> because death immediately you're in his presence. But nevertheless, um, Esther tells the king, I want to do another banquet. I want it more elaborate, but I just want you and Haman here. Well, he, Haman tells his wife about this. He said, darling, you, you've got to understand, I never thought this would happen in my lifetime. I'm going to be elevated again. Well, when he gets in, the king and him are talking. Now, the king doesn't know the exact plot that would took, take place. But as they're eating, he says to Haman, I got something I want to ask you. He said, what should we do for a man that heard about a, um, a plot to overthrow the kingdom, to destroy me, take the kingdom over? What should we do for a man like that that actually warned me and thwarted it? He said, we ought to honor that man. Haman says this. And he says, well, what, what should we do, Haman? He said, you ought to take your personal robe and put it on him. Give him your personal scepter and put him on your personal horse and parade him through the streets. Let there be a parade in his honor and all the people will applaud because Haman thinks he's talking about him. And he was thinking, man, I wish my wife was here. I wish my family so they could see what's about to happen. And then more, um, Ahasuerus the king to Haman's Dismay, he says, that's exactly what I want you to do to Mordecai the Jew. Now, he could have failed it at that point. And while he's going out, Esther whispers in his ear and says, King, he's the one that was going to destroy all the Jews. He's the one that was going to destroy the man that warned you and actually helped to thwart this overthrow of the kingdom. And as he's walking out, 
Haman was seized. The king said, seize him. He's seized. Now they, he's hanging on his own gallows. Now what I'm trying to say, that I took a little too long with that story. God will always intervene in every situation of what the enemy tries to do in our lives. We need to realize this. He goes ahead of us. Remember Moses said, Lord, we want to see your glory. He said, you can't see, my, no man can see my face. No man can see this and live. But he said, I want to see your glory. If we don't have your glory with us, we won't go. God sends the glory ahead. But realizing this, God reversed every decision that was planned against his people. He's done this for generations. I know we hear this over and over and over and over. He's done this for generations and generations and generations. And he never forgets our works of righteousness. I did something for someone the other day that just didn't dis, didn't like me, disliked me, disliked the ministry. I don't know why I never did anything to the person, but I did something very special for them. And now that person has become my friend. <laughs> this person would not even speak to me if I saw him on the street or the parking lot. And I did just one little act of kindness, took me a couple of hours, and now he's my best friend or thinks he is. But see, God doesn't forget that. Had I retaliated and said, I don't want to talk to you anyway. Don't speak to me. You know, you're not even in my class. No, but you, God remembers the work of righteousness. He remembers the work of faith. Remember in Malachi chapter 3, I believe it's verse 16. The Lord has a book of remembrance. He remembers what we've done. Now, he, the Lord kept the king awake so that he could get that record into his hands to read how God had brought deliverance. He will trouble those that and disturb those when they try to assign to destroy you and put you down. He'll promote you. He'll favor you. He'll help you. He'll give to you. Isaiah 60 and verse 10. I read this often. Read it again this morning. And the sons and daughters of strangers shall build up your walls and their kings shall minister to you. What he was talking about was restoration. What he was talking about is taking those and situations and even people that have been against you, and now they will turn on your side. He said, I'll make them work for you. <laughs> Remember when Nehemiah was rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, there were some of those that complained and the enemy that just did not want this to happen. And remember, they wound up, the very ones that quit, they wound up having to build the wall and pay money to help build it. And they didn't even like Nehemiah in the beginning. But those who betrayed you, those who have cast your name out for evil, those who might have stolen from you, will eventually repay you. God promises it. Now I'm almost done with this. Now that's the celebration of, of Purim, of why, why we celebrate this every year. We, we didn't have a celebration probably as we should, but at least to bring it up, to realize it is a historic fact of how God changed an entire kingdom with one person. He changed the entire world with one man. We know that was with Jesus. Now, the decline of morality, purity, justice, righteousness, honesty in our great nation and the world has put us in jeopardy like we've never been, like we've not been probably many generations. But our God still honors those that are here. Listen to this, Proverbs 14. Righteousness exalt, righteousness exalts, stabilizes a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The favor of the king is toward a wise servant or wise people, but his wrath is against him that causes shame. Now, I'm not just talking about America. Shame has been brought into the world. What I started out with a few moments ago talking about uh, inclusion, and the gender question that's going on, little by little, we're being pushed to the point it's being pushed down our throats. Not just the gender thing, but many other avenues and many other diversities is being pushed down our throat. We're being forced to accept it, just like wearing the mask during um, COVID. <laughs> I know people, and some of you the same thing, I know people that wore the mask, took the vaccine, and still got it. And maybe more than one time. But it was forced. It was a, and then you had to have a card traveling to other nations. Again, it's a precursor to how the Antichrist kingdom will work. I've said that many times. But think about this. Do we actually 
C, are we actually paying attention? I know we are here, but I'm talking to you that perhaps are watching. Are you really seeing what's going on in the world you live in? You say, well, I'm not part of the world. Well, Jesus said you're in the world, but you're not of it. We're not part of it. But the system that is in this world, we have to abide by it. We hear what's going on economically. We hear what's going on politically. We hear what's going on militarily over and over. And you're wondering, what do I believe? What do I do? Well, Paul told the church at Thessalonica, he said, when they say peace and safety to you, beware. But he said, sudden destruction will come upon like travail upon a woman with child. So so the point is this. It's a time to seek God, to run after him. I was telling the Lord this last night, several times, waking up in the middle of the night. I want to see you move, God, the way that I've experienced in past years. Past years, we don't have time to talk about it, but the things that I've seen, the things that I've experienced, the, my, my heart just begins to leap when I look back at those things. The same thing with each and every one of us. Look, some of the things that God has done. Look how he delivered you. Look, look how he set you free. Look how he blessed you and prospered you. And even though these things seem to be in the past, as far as God's concerned, they're present. They're relevant ready to renew them again and again and again. We heard about the revival that was going to Asbury College in uh, Wilmore, Kentucky, an incredible move of God, but that wasn't the first time it happened there. But all over the world, I said this a few weeks ago, there's pockets of anointing here and pockets of anointing there. What are we willing to do? And this is a closing question. What are we willing to do to experience a real move of God? At one time, we did corporate prayer every week, praying and declaring and and decreeing what should go on in the nation and what should go on in the church. What are we willing to do for our personal lives, for our ministry or for perhaps our, our home, our job, our family? What are we willing to do to experience a move of God? What are we willing to lay down? Revival is in the world. Revival is happening. Restoration is happening. Recovery is happening, but not everywhere. I want to be where it is. <laughs> I want to be where it's happening and where he's doing everything that he promised. Now, you that may be watching us, we thank you for joining us. And I pray that if, if you don't know the Lord, all you, it's not hard. All you have to say is, Jesus, forgive me for my sin. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. You're born again. No big thing that, that you have to go through. No ritual. Not even joining a church. But I encourage you, if you haven't been born again, you've accepted him now, find a good Bible-believing church. But perhaps you've become cold and lukewarm. This happens. Remember what he said in Revelation chapter 3 to the church of Laodicea. He said, you're not, lu- you're not cold or hot, you're lukewarm. And he said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. So if that's maybe the situation you've been in, you don't need to start all over again. Just start where you left off and serve him. And pray that he will give you a heart to run after him, chase after him. You say, is he running from me? No, that's not what I mean. But to run after him with your whole heart, embrace him, everything in you reaching out toward him. Sometimes we, 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 we are so structured and we're going to get away from this. We are so structured in what we do and sometimes in our service times because of Facebook and the things that we have to worry about. I'm telling you, the time is just ahead of us. And <laughs> God's going to say, forget that nonsense. If you want to move, then worship me. And pray, make the declarations. If you really want what I'm going to bring, then I'll bring it to you if you prepare yourself for it. Now, maybe you're one of those people. Now, if you don't have a church that you're connected to, we don't want to take you out of a church you're already part of. We meet every Sunday at 1045, every Sunday now, at 221 Paul's Drive, Suite A. We're using Tabernacle Bible College facility, and we'd love to have you. And we're, we will be developing more and more for children's church if you have children that you could come. But let us know if we can help you in any way whatsoever. So now until next week, God bless you. We'll see you next week about, well, we start at 1045, probably on Facebook by about uh, 1115, 1120. And we'll see you then. God bless you.
Hallelujah.